Good day and welcome to the Mondelez International 4th Quarter 2019 Year-End Earnings Conference Call. Today's call is scheduled to last about one hour, including remarks by Mondelez Management and the question and answer session. In order to ask a question, please press the star key followed by the number 1 on your touchtone phone at any time during the call. I'd now like to turn the call over to Mr. Chef Benlep, Vice President Investor Relations of Mondelez. Please go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. With me today are Dirk Vandefoot, our Chairman and CEO, and Luca Zaramella, our CFO. Earlier today, we sent out our press release and presentation slides, which are available on our website, mondelezeinternational.com forward slash investors. During this call, we'll make forward-looking statements about the company's performance. These statements are based on how we see things today. Actual results may differ materially due to risks and uncertainties. Please refer to the cautionary statements and risk factors contained in our 10-K and 10-Q filings for more details on our forward-looking statements. As we discuss our results today, unless notes as reported, we'll be referencing our non-GAAP financial measures, which adjust for certain items included in our GAAP results. In addition, we provide our year-over-year growth on a constant currency basis, unless otherwise noted. You can find the comparable GAAP measures and GAAP to non-GAAP reconciliations within our earnings release and at the back of the slide presentation. In today's call, Dirk will give you an overview of our results as well as a progress update against our strategic priorities. Then Luca will take you through the financials and our outlook. We'll close with Q&A. And with that, I'll now turn the call over to Dirk. Thank you, Shep, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I will start off on slide four called Delivering Long-Term shareholder value creation. 2019 was a a great year for Mondelez International. It was the first full year under our new consumer-centric growth strategy, and we delivered strong results on the top and the bottom line while generating significant free cash flow. Our solid execution and uh, targeted investments in both our global and local brands enabled us to meet or exceed all of our financial targets for the year. These results give us increasing conviction that our strategy will create sustained momentum in our business, allowing us to deliver on our long-term financial targets in the years to come. Switching to slide five, recapping the year, here are a few uh, highlights. We delivered organic net revenue growth of 4.1%, which was broad-based across geographies and brands and was driven by both volume and pricing. In terms of geographies, uh, emerging market growth was strong, growing mid-single digit ex Argentina and driven primarily by key geographies like China, Russia and India, but also by emerging high growth markets in Southeast Asia. Developed markets showed robust growth with both Europe and North America performing well, delivering share gains and driving category growth. Overall, the results reflect the quality of our brand portfolio with our unique combination of both global and local brands benefiting from increased and targeted investments throughout the year. Our adjusted EPS growth was more than 8% for the year, and we are pleased with our full year free cash flow generation of about $3 billion, which was well ahead of our outlook. Switching to slide six, our strategy is now well embedded in the business. In the past 12 months, we've made great strides in implementing it across the different business units. The rollout of the new strategy was reinforced by our new way of incentivizing our teams assuring that everybody is clear on what is important. At its core, we are constantly trying to be more consumer-centric, using our new and unique understanding of consumers around the world to develop a more effective and a more consistent approach to marketing. And as a consequence, growth in our global brands has accelerated further, while our local brand growth is now very close to overall category growth. We've also invested in further growth in non-grocery channels like discounters, 
e-commerce and convenience, as well as in expanding our distribution in fast-growing developing markets like China, India, and Russia. As it relates to innovation, we are becoming more agile and faster, trying many new ideas, and in fact rolling out fewer initiatives but with bigger success. We are clear too that strategy only succeeds with outstanding execution. And while we still have a long way to go, I credit a big part of our results to better execution in our commercial as well as our supply chain operations. North America's supply chain in 2019 definitely showed significant improvement. Our European teams executed against the seasonal opportunity like Easter and Christmas better than in recent years, and our teams in India and China reached the highest level of, of execution in store as well as in the plants. However, the opportunity to constantly improve our execution remains significant as our recent struggles with our supply chain in Brazil would indicate. As it relates to our operating costs, while we are in the first place trying to leverage volume growth to a lower delivered cost per ton, we still see significant opportunity to optimize many other cost areas. While more and better marketing as well as strongly improved execution have driven our 2019 results, a shift in mindset around the company also has had an important impact. The most important part of this shift was driven by our local first approach, basically empowering local business units to make the right choices for their consumers and their clients. This empowerment has led to clearer accountability and faster decision making and was reinforced by focused incentives. I am proud of how the teams have embraced this new culture and really believe that this model has great potential for the future. While we are talking about culture, I'd also like to mention a change in the leadership of our Latin American region. We are announcing today that Gustavo Valle will join us as Region President Latin America effective February 1st. Gustavo comes from Danone where he's held numerous positions around the globe. In his last role, he was leading the global dairy and plant-based division. Earlier in his career, he managed the Argentine and Brazilian business and brings with him significant experience in the volatile econ economies of Latin America. I look forward to working with Gustavo again. Switching to slide seven, while we are excited about our financial results and prospects, in today's world, any consumer business needs to have as strong a social and environmental agenda as a financial agenda. Our own employees as well as our consumers demand it, and customers, investors, and other stakeholders expect it. So I'm happy to say that in 2019, we have made great progress in embedding our purpose to empower people to snack right. We announced a new sustainable snacking strategy with new goals and stronger commitments. In cocoa, our biggest commodity, we are committing to sourcing the equivalent of 100% of the cocoa we need for our chocolate brands through our Cocoa Life program by 2025. Today, I am proud to share that we have achieved 63% by the end of 2019, an increase from 43% in 2018 and with a clear roadmap for the remainder. Earlier this year, we joined other major companies in renewing our commitment to the Paris Climate Accord and have set our path towards further reduction in carbon emissions. Looking towards the consumer, we are focused on making the packaging for all our products 100% recyclable by 2025. And by the end of 2019, we are already at 92% with some interesting trials underway to unlock the remaining 8% of that journey. Finally, as it relates to the mindful enjoyment of our products, we are committed to increasing our mix of portion control packs to 20% of our total revenues. We are well on the way with 15% already sold in such formats. 
We know that our future growth and success as a company depends on ensuring people and planet thrive, and we are committed to tracking and reporting on our progress and impact transparently along the way. I look forward to sharing more with you in 2020. And with that, I will hand it over to Luca. Thank you, Dirk, and uh, good afternoon. On slide nine is our financial performance for both quarter four and full year. We ended 2019 strongly, continuing the momentum we have created since the beginning of our new strategic plan. This is the case as it relates to organic top-line growth that translated into earnings growth and free cash flow. We believe these outcomes to be high quality. Revenue growth was broad-based by region, global and local brands, and in terms of developed and emerging markets. As a matter of fact, 12 out of the 13 business units delivered growth in 2019. Importantly, there was a good balance of volume and pricing, both of which are important. Volume allowing us to leverage the great infrastructure we have created with much work over the last few years, and pricing to drive value. This balance results in top line drove attractive profit dollar growth while enabling reinvestments in our brands. In Q4 and throughout 2019, we also made significant investments in areas like Europe and EMEA to further support our brands and broader growth initiatives, as well as in the biscuits category in North America and certain markets in Latin America. These investments were in line with our original plan and a bit higher in certain areas and delivered on expected returns and share gains. Turning to slide 10. Overall, we grew 4.1 in both Q4 and in 2019. We delivered strong volume and pricing-led growth in virtually all key emerging markets like China, India, Southeast Asia, Russia, Mexico, and Africa. In aggregate, emerging markets grew approximately 8% for both the year and the quarter. Excluding inflation-driven growth in Argentina, emerging markets grew 6% for the year. These results support our conviction that our emerging market footprint is a competitive advantage, and the investments we have been making in 19 and previous years are paying off. Developed markets also deliver solid results for the year and quarter, with revenue growth of approximately 2%, driven by improved results out of both Europe and North America, we share gains in both regions. As we said in previous calls, particularly in Europe, these results were aided by a longer Easter season and a milder summer than 2018. Now let's review our profitability performance on slide 11. We increased gross profit by 4% for the full year and 4.4% in Q4. This gross profit dollar increase enabled a step up in growth investments focused on working media and route-to-market capabilities. We also drove solid OI dollar improvements with volume leverage, pricing, and cost savings partially offset by growth investment. Moving to regional performance on slide 12 for the full year, Europe executed very well for the year with 3.7% revenue growth. These results include strong volume-driven growth in developed markets, such as the UK and Germany, which grew mid-single digit, as well as Russia, which posted double-digit growth for the full year, behind strong volumes and share gains. We delivered consistent execution in chocolate and seasonals throughout the year, and the strong execution resulted both in share gains, particularly in our chocolate business, and good category growth. Adjusted OI dollars grew by almost 6% in spite of significant investment in areas like ANC. EU shows the full potential of our model as we draw solid volume-driven market growth, gain share, and deliver strong gross profit progression that allowed for ANC step-up. AMIA grew 5.3% 
showing continued strength across much of the region. India grew double digits behind another year of strong execution and investment. We continue to help drive the chocolate market while making progress against our plans of building a larger biscuit platform. China grew high single digits for the year, driven by strengths in both biscuits and gum, and great execution in both e-commerce as well as the offline channels. Southeast Asia grew mid-single digit with solid results in biscuits and chocolate. AMIA increased operating income dollars by more than 9% due to leverage from top-line growth. This growth comes despite some significant investments in ANC and route to market. The limited OI growth in Q4 is entirely due to additional investments in ANC, and those were enabled by continued strong gross profit growth that we saw throughout the whole year. Again, our algorithm is working quite well in this region. Latin America grew 7.8%, due primarily to inflation-driven growth in Argentina. Revenue increased 1.7%, excluding Argentina. Mexico grew mid-single digit, driven by strong execution and share growth across most categories. In Brazil, we saw a slight decline in revenue driven primarily by a reduction of trade stocks in powder beverages, partially offset by lapping the general tracker strike in 18. We are beginning to take actions in this category, including the launch of new marketing communications and product formulation. Adjusted white dollars in Latin America declined by approximately 6% primarily due to volume losses in powder beverages in Brazil, along with some remaining supply chain costs from our plant transition. We do not expect material plant transition costs to continue in 2020. For the quarter, the significant growth in OI is due to lapping some one-timers related to Forex contract settling last year and some legal cases. While we are reassured by the solidity of the business in Mexico and the Western Andean region, and dealing well with the volatility of Argentina, we recognize there is more work to do in Brazil, and the focus of Gustavo and team will be mostly on that. Finally, North America grew 2.2% for the full year, and more than 3% in Q4, driven by improved volumes. We closed the year well, and deliver strong share results in Biscuit, with growth in a number of key brands, including Oreo, Ritz, and Belvita. We continue to make investments in ANC, and we are seeing our brands respond favorably, mainly when coupled with our excellent DSD execution. The North American region grew OI by more than 6% for the year, due to leverage, effective pricing, and waste reduction, with additional ANC mostly in our biscuits brands. North America had strong gross profit delivery throughout the year, and Q4 was no exception to that. But again, levels of ANC stepped up in Q4. Turning to category highlights, our three snacking categories continue to demonstrate attractive growth, with total category growth of 3.6% for the year. We did see a more normalized growth in our categories for Q4 at 2.8%. As some of the tailwinds that helped Q2 and Q3, a longer Easter in Q2 and a milder summer in both Q2 and Q3, subsided in the last part of the year. However, we remain encouraged by the health of our categories and believe they can continue to sustain growth of around 3% over the long term and this is what our long-term algorithm is predicated upon. There are a number of very significant areas where we had drive the category growth in 2019. Among those, U.S. Biscuit, where we continue to execute better on marketing and execution at point of sales, and where we draw both value and volume growth through DSD. UK, India, and Russia Chocolate where our, where our renewed marketing bundles on both global and local brands, coupled with sales excellence, draw substantial value for the category. Overall, we held or gained share in 75% of our business in 19, which reflects the progress on our broader strategy of volume and share improvement. 
Overall, our share were up for the year in aggregate, ending several years of share losses. And we ended the year on an improved trajectory. By category, our biscuit business grew 4.4%. Approximately 75% of our revenue grew or held share in this category, including our US, China, Russia, and India businesses. In chocolate, our business grew 5.8%. Approximately 85% of our revenue grew or held share, including the UK, Australia, and Russia. Gum and candy revenue grew slightly. About 35% of our revenue in this business gained or held share, including strengths in China and France gum and Russia candy. Now turning to EPS on slide 18. Full year EPS grew more than 8%. This growth primarily reflected operating gains driven by strong revenue results, income from JV equity stakes, despite some tax wins in Q4, and lower than expected interest expense driven by accelerated cash flow, focused balance sheet management, and favorable rate environment. I now move on to our free cash flow results on slide 19. We delivered full year free cash flow of 3 billion, which was above our outlook and a nearly $200 million improvement over last year due, due to strong income, continued progress in our cash conversion cycle, as well as lower cash restructuring and capex. On page 20, we returned 3 billion to our shareholders for the full year. This brings us to more than $24 billion in capital return since Mondelez was formed. Now, let me provide some details around our outlook for 2020. At a high level, we expect an own algorithm year for uh, 2020 in terms of our financial outlook. We expect organic net revenue growth of 3% plus. This is predicated on our view of category growth of approximately 3%, some share gains, and revenue growth driven by both volume and pricing. We expect adjusted EPS in the high single digit range. This outlook implies continued growth of gross profit dollars and volume leverage. It also reflects another step up in investment levels primarily in ANC and sales capabilities, to continue to support sustainable and high quality growth, as well as some cost savings to fund incremental investment. With respect to free cash flow, we are expecting approximately 3 billion. Recall, this outlook includes additional cash tax impact resulting from the US tax reform. In this outlook, we also expect our 2020 adjusted effective tax rate to be in the low to mid 20s and distressed expense of approximately 380 million. Although we do not provide a quarterly outlook on a key metrics, it is important to note that the following items in terms of phasing will impact 2020. Both Easter and Chinese New Year fall earlier this year when compared to 2019. In terms of year-over-year -year comparisons, our commodity pipeline is relatively more unfavorable in the first part of the year versus the second part of the year, especially in the first quarter. And we have covered most of the key commodities for 2020. We also feel good about overall levels of pricing in the plan. With that, let's open the line for questions. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. So we'll take our first question from the line of Andrew Lazar with Barclays. Good evening, everybody. Hi, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Yeah. Hi. Um, just two for me. First, I'd say, um, obviously, Mondelez had a much stronger than initially planned 2019, um, especially on organic sales growth. Uh, the company is looking for 3% plus in 2020, uh, which is the long-term algorithm, as you said, though obviously a deceleration from, from the 4% plus you, you showed in 2019. 
I was hoping you could talk a bit to this in terms of, um, you know, where or whether you're building in some conserv some conserv some conservatism there, or if there's really something more specific behind it, whether it's, as you said, you know, lapping a, a longer Easter and a, and a hotter summer and things of that nature. And then I've got to follow up. Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, 19 was a good year for us. Uh, uh, we, we've just went uh, through the numbers, um, not only because of the numbers, but I think also that it was sort of the first confirmation that our strategy is working. This was the first year, full year, with the new strategy for us. Um, and we, we saw a number of signs that we think uh, will continue next year, like the volume growth, like solid gross profit and OI dollar growth, uh, market share gains, uh, continued cost discipline. It was, as you alluded, uh, helped uh, by uh, a later Easter season, which gives us more time in store, and also that we lapped the, the very hot summer of 2018 in Europe in, in 19. Um, so we, we can see now the markets uh, in the last quarter were, uh, or the categories were more at 2.8%, not around the 4% that they were in the middle of the year. Um, I think the, 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 the unlocks that we have, we will continue to work those, eh? put the consumer first, keep on focusing on our execution, and keep on increasing our investments, uh, and keep on improving our marketing, activating our local brands. So all that will continue next year. And also what we have done uh, as it relates to our responsibilities and goals and better alignment of our incentives, we're making a few more tweaks this year. Um, and we have a number of issues that we need to solve. Uh, in the first place, Brazil's supply chain, which is, which is uh, going better. Um, uh, but also we have to pay attention to China, for instance. So all that, um, for us, we're saying the markets or the categories we think will be around 3%. We see ourselves uh, increasing our market share. Um, and so we, we call it a 3% plus in line with our long-term algorithm. Um, and it's the beginning of the year. Uh, we are always very thoughtful as we, as we set our targets, and, uh, and we'll see how the first quarter goes. Um, but at this stage, we feel that it's, it's certainly not, in our book, a uh, slowdown from, uh, from this year. We, we continue as we are, but we do believe that the categories will be a little bit less than they were last year because of the reasons that I said. Um, I think uh, apart from, uh, from the two watch out that I mentioned, we see nothing at this stage that would uh, particularly preoccupy us for the start of the year. So overall, I would say for us, it's continue the strategy as we are. Yes, the numbers are a little bit less than they were in uh, uh, 19, but that was largely dri driven by the structure of how things came about in 19, and 20 is a continuation of, of where we are. Got it. Thanks very much. I'll leave it there. Okay. Our next question is from Brian Splain with BOA. Hey, good, good afternoon, everyone. Hi, Brian. Uh, Brian. I, so I guess um, I wanted to pick up just on, on the uh, expectation for incremental investment for 2020. Um, so maybe just a couple of, of points around that. First, if, if you can kind of maybe size what the incremental investment in 20 would be relative to what it was in 2019, and then I guess as we're thinking about the sources of that, would, would, we, would it sort of suggest that you'd have gross profit dollar growth growing faster than operating profit growth because there's going to be some incremental investment uh, in A and C, or am I not thinking about that correctly? No, I think you're – well, it, it's, uh, you're thinking about it correctly, but let me start from, from the start. Um, and so in uh, 19, our extra investment was about 150 million, largely focused on more A and C route to market as R and D. And, and we're going to be in the same ballpark in 2020 as extra investment. Um, in 19, we had planned that that extra investment would have an impact on earnings. I don't know if you remember, we said we would be uh, sort of around uh, uh, mid single digit earnings. But then during the year, our sales came in better as expected. We generated more gross profit, and in the end, we, we were uh, ending the year on an 8% uh, EPS increase. However, we had Brazil that uh, affected us in, in a way, and, and in fact, our gross profit could have uh, grown more, and we, we, we would have hoped to invest more in 19. So um, in 20, the 
extra gross profit that we're adding is uh, slightly higher than we did in uh, in 19 in dollars and uh, we're flowing uh, um, uh, let's say 40 percent of that roughly into into ANC and, and the other investment areas um, so it's it's similar to what it was last year but we don't have the negative effect of Brazil and that's why we can continue with that algorithm and deliver a uh, uh, high single digit EPS growth that's that's helpful. And then just in terms of where geographically the spend is going to be, could you just maybe give us a little bit of color on kind of maybe where you where you emphasized uh, the extra spend in, in 19 and kind of where the, the incremental piece is going in 20? And I'll leave it there. Thanks. Yes. It goes largely to, to first of all, the two sources or the two destinations of the money is one in extra uh, marketing uh, media investment. To be very specific, it's all in media. And the second part is in in distribution expansion. So the extra media investment is a little bit across the board in most countries. Um, It's different the level that we do that, but the idea is to continue uh, increasing our media uh, pressure. Uh, As it relates to the route to market, that is more concentrated in the emerging markets, the Indias, the Chinas, the Russias, where we still have a huge opportunity to increase our, our distribution. I would also like to add that um, as it relates to those media investments, not only are we increasing the overall spent on ANC, but within that ANC we're shifting more into media, so we're increasing our working media spent uh, largely through digital. And then also uh, we constantly are trying to increase our ROI, which uh, increased about uh, 12% in in, uh, 19 on our media spent. So, and, and on top of that, we have restructured our agency, so we also think that our non-media spend will have higher efficiency and, and higher quality. So, all that together, uh, we have the effect of the higher investment, but also that reshifting, which has a pretty big effect on, on, on our media pressure. So, that's a little bit how it all comes together. That's great. Thank you for that color. Okay. We'll take our next question from Dara Massinian with Morgan Stanley. Hey guys. Hi. Um, obviously, some pretty strong results in terms of organic sales growth in 2019, uh, but within that, we saw a really solid acceleration in volume growth. So, I, I'd love to hear a bit of a state of the union now that the full year results are in on, you know, what drove that in your mind, how sustainable that volume pickup is going forward. You mentioned both volume mix and pricing will be up next year. Is is one you know, a bigger driver of that organic sales growth than the other. And then secondly on Brazil, um, have the supply chain issues, are those now been resolved and they're behind you? And maybe just give us a little more of an update on how you're managing the powdered beverage business and if we should expect sequential improvement in the first half of the year versus the back half of last year. Are those strategies take longer to play out? Thanks. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start and maybe Dirk will cover a little bit uh, Brazil. So as to volume, uh, clearly we like what we are seeing. Uh, we like uh, that offline growth is coming mostly uh, through, you know, a good balance of uh, both volume and pricing. We believe that balance is, uh, is quite important because it allows us to create value in the marketplace, but at the same time, to have the leverage that we need for our algorithm to, to really fully work. Um, it is uh, pretty much across the board. Maybe looking at the numbers, you might say it is a little bit less in emerging markets, but when you strip out Argentina, uh, you really see a good balance of volume and pricing even in, uh, in emerging markets. Uh, we keep on investing on our franchises in route to market, uh, in uh, quality of our brands, and so we expect that uh, to continue. And we will always try to strike the right balance between uh, uh, pricing and, uh, and volume. So I don't think Q4 was a material exception to the rest of the year. I think you know the only one that uh, came back in terms of volume growth in the second part of the year is North America, that, it, that is executing quite well behind Biscuit. Uh, both in, term of, in terms of marketing and, uh, and I would say in terms of the, the execution. So I think we will continue seeing that uh, as we continue investing in our franchises. In Brazil, quite frankly, the supply chain issue is uh, for the most part behind us, but there is more work to be done. 
uh, and uh, and on PBs, I don't know if, if you want to comment a bit on uh, specifically on uh, what we're doing and how we see that uh, progressing in 2020. Yes. Um, yeah. So uh, uh, the the PB market is uh, is starting to to recuperate a little bit, but still. Uh, not that great, and on top of that, Tang, our brand, which was the, the leading brand, was uh, having some uh, share challenges. Um, so what? Uh, and, and as a result of that, we saw some destocking of PBs in the trade because there was less demand for it. So uh, what we're doing is we are uh, launching a new bundle on Tang, uh, going a little bit back to what Tang was in the past. Uh, we had probably drifted a little bit too much into new variety, new flavor, and so on, and uh, more bringing it back to um, how how Tang can really play a role in the uh, daily uh, um, beverage choice of kids in the family and, and how it contributes to that. Um, we're increasing our investments. We're launching a new campaign. We're launching, of course, a, n a number of new uh, flavors. Uh, but uh, overall, it's a bit too early to say what's going to happen. We're in the middle of the season of, uh, of Brazil at the moment, but that's what we're doing on uh, powdered beverages. In terms of comparisons, uh, the second part of the year will be easier in terms of top line because we started the, the stocking of PBs in the second part. So I think that's maybe the way you have to think about uh, how it will phase out throughout the year. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Darren. Our next question is from John Baumgartner with Wells Fargo. Good afternoon. Thanks for the question. Hi. Hi. Dirk, I wanted to dig a little bit into the local brands, um, and I guess first off, can you maybe ballpark what percentage of the revenue base there that's already been activated with the increased investments, and of the brands that have not been activated, how are you thinking about the phasing of the investment uptick between you know 2020 maybe 2021 at this point? Yeah, so the the local brands, I would I would roughly say um, about 45 percent of our portfolio is global brands. About 45 is local brands that we want to activate, and then about 10% is, is uh, a brands that we do not want to activate and, and largely run them for cash. Um, of those local brands, those 45%, uh, most of them have been uh, activated. I wouldn't say yet with uh, optimal uh, media uh, spent yet, so that's, that's where we want to increase it. But the ones that, that uh, we have been able to increase media and reposition them and uh, give them sort of a new, uh, uh, a new uh, purpose, that has worked really well for us. So uh, one of the, the most striking examples would, uh, would be Jubilee in, in Russia, which is an, uh, a legacy uh, biscuit brand, um, which was kind of dormant. And we've uh, revamped it, and uh, it's now showing double-digit growth and a strong market share increase. And we see that with a number of brands, Lou in Europe, uh, uh, we see that with a number of brands around the world. So I, I wouldn't say that it's, it, it, within that 45% that uh, part was not activated and other parts was activated, no. But overall, the, the local brands are growing 3.2% versus the global brands. But the local brands are now getting very close to category growth, and we really want them to be in line with category growth. And the global brands clearly need to be above that. That's, that's the way we think about it. Okay. And then just to follow up on that, where you have increased the investment in those local brands, I'm curious how your competitors are responding. Are you seeing them generally staying rational in terms of pricing and, you know, kind of following your lead, doubling down on marketing and innovation of their own? Just, you know, what are the observations there so far in terms of the competitive dynamics? Well, uh, we try to uh, avoid to, to run uh, uh, price promotions and so on on the local brand. So the reaction there has been, I mean, I wouldn't say we're really in a, in a, in a price war, uh, as I think about it around the world. Um, yeah, as, as we move some of these bloc local brands, and sometimes we move them more uh, into the sustainability direction and things like that, yeah, there is uh, a reaction of competition trying to do the same. But I think overall that's very good for the category because that will help the consumer uh, increase its interest in our category. So we're not against it. I think it's a, it's a good movement overall. Great. Thank you for your time. Okay. We'll check out our next question from Chris Grody with Stiefel. Hi, good evening. Hi, Chris. Hi, Chris. Hi. 
I just had a question if I could ask first, and I don't think you've addressed it yet, but just I'm curious what rate of inflation you expect for this year. And then related to that, you've talked about some pricing, you have some cost savings coming through. Is it pricing that mostly offsets cost inflation for the year, or will you need some, maybe your simplified of growth savings offsets on that as well? So, you know, I think when you look at uh, the last couple of years, uh, we have seen quite a bit of uh, inflation pressure, mostly around, I would say, transportation costs, labor costs, and uh, I would add Forex to that. Clearly, with the dollar uh, strengthening, there was a big inflation component attached to that. Um, commodities were a little bit more favorable than uh, the last five years, over the last couple of years, I would say. Uh, as we move forward, we see um, a little bit of more uh, normal inflation pressure around uh, labor, and clearly there are differences around the world. There are you know, economies like India where labor inflation is, uh, is quite high, but overall for the company it is a little bit uh, lower in that area. Uh, but clearly we see a little bit uh, more of a commodity-driven inflation, particularly around cocoa, uh, dairy is another one, um, and packaging costs as well. So all in all, we expect uh, commodities, forex, and inflation to be in 2020 in the ballpark of what we have seen in, uh, in 19. And so we expect, obviously, to, uh, to price that away. In, in the short term, I think we do as a company a good job in uh, putting in place good coverage strategies. And so we are never hand to mouth in terms of uh, some of these commodities or, you know, uh, even some packaging uh, inflation can be covered well through uh, various instruments. Uh, and so in the short term, we will always try to strike the best balance between, uh, you know, our volume, our pricing, and our inflation. In the long term or in the medium term, we really want to price it away. I can't give you the exact number in terms of uh, pricing. We don't guide to a breakdown between, you know, what we say in terms of revenue and volume and pricing. But I think it is fair to say I don't see uh, dynamics changing dramatically into, into 2020. Um, what we do in terms of, uh, uh, you know, productivity and cost savings initiatives, reality is uh, what we would like to do is for that money uh, to be half reinvested back into the business and fund uh, ANC and route to market investment, and the rest to be dropped to, to the bottom line. So that's the way we think. We see uh, productivity and cost saving initiatives to be the real upside to margin and uh, stepped up uh, investment. Okay, thank you for that. I had just one other quick question, which would be, um, and I think it, I think this gets classified under the route to market investments. But you've you've had expansion of distribution and some of the faster growth channels. Um, you talk about the U.S. and club stores and discount stores, and I think that's also occurring in the emerging markets. I'm just curious: is that an incremental investment level for you? Is that costing more? Is that part of your investment in 2020 as well? And should we see that be a contributor to revenue growth? Um, yes, um, we are. If I would summarize what we did in 19, which we are largely repeating in 20, maybe even increasing a little bit, in uh, the developed markets, that would be um, uh, particularly around uh, seasonals that we try to uh, have uh, better and stronger in-store presence, and then also uh, going into um, the uh, what we call the alternative growth channels in the U.S. That would be convenience, for instance, and put. The, a bit more manpower, a bit more investment in there. In the emerging markets, it largely has to see with physical distribution, uh, opening more distribution centers, having more trucks on the road, putting more uh, coolers in the stores in, in India. But also in China, for instance, it means going into third-tier cities, setting up sales teams there, and, and uh, starting to cover these cities. So, for instance, in China, we've added about 140,000 new stores uh, this year, and we are planning to continue that into the 2020. So it, it does help our revenue, clearly. I mean, we're seeing uh, uh, well above category growth in China, and we are seeing very strong double-digit growth in, in, uh, in India. And we, uh, we are counting that our distribution expansion is, is helping us. And at the same time, in the developed markets, we, we want to continue that shift into more seasonals and more alternative growth channels, which also will help our revenue grow. We'll take our next question from Steve Stracolia with UBS. Hi, good afternoon. 
So, so Dirk, a quick question for you to kick off. Um, as you think about the outlook for 2020 uh, in your guidance for 3% plus growth, how should we think about how you t evaluated macro considerations, whether it be what's kind of unfolding in front of us in China right now, or even what some of the other multinational companies have cited with macro softness in select countries across um, South America? I know that you called out discrete issues um, for the powder beverage category, but I'd love to hear um, your view on those two macro situations, and then have a quick follow up for Luca. Okay. Um, so if, if I start with uh, maybe the uh, the uh, um, developed markets, um, if if we see a little bit of a pullback in developed markets, which we don't see at the moment, to be honest, we see some very vibrant growth in Europe and, and in the US. So it's it's clearly not visible for us. But I would say our, our snacking categories are a little bit more resilient if there would be a pullback in the economy um, than other FMCG uh, categories. Trade tensions between the U.S. and others are really not uh, currently impacting us. Um, Brexit, I would say, um, is uh, a risk, although I don't see it in 2020. But if, if there would be no deal near the end of the year, that, that would be possibly a, a disruptor. Uh, but we, I assume at this stage that they will find a deal and that it will be a relatively smooth transition. Uh, in the emerging markets, and I know that uh, some, some of our colleagues are seeing different impacts there, um, we, we are not feeling an impact in India or in China, um, but we would probably be a bit more cautious around uh, projections for Latin America. Um, ob obviously, we have a high inflationary environment in Argentina, um, which we are largely managing to protect our scale and our absolute profit generation as well as our cash flow in the country. Um, and we do know, and, and we see it, of course, that there is more volatility in emerging markets, but we feel that the growth opportunities far outweigh the risks of that. Um, you have to also take into account that snacking behavior and snacking demand is still growing very fast in these markets, and, and there's still a, a lot of runway there. Um, and then um, I, I would overall say that uh, our categories are showing an acceleration into, into uh, 2019. We're forecasting them at 3%, which is our long-term expectation for our categories. We don't see that at the moment as, uh, as uh, being a risk uh, because we believe that there is still a lot of opportunity for consumers to, to keep on snacking more. And, for instance, our study we recently did about the state of snacking clearly showed that the behavior is, uh, is on the uptick. So overall, I, I would say we cannot confirm some of the other uh, impressions that you've heard from some of our colleagues. We feel pretty good about what we're seeing around the world. Thanks. Very helpful. And then a quick question for Luca. Did I miss in your prepared remarks for fiscal 20 guidance what the EBIT dollar outlook would be on a constant currency basis to kind of get to the algorithm you're on EPS? Look, we purposely didn't go there necessarily. Um, we gave you enough elements. I, I think Dear commented a bit on, uh, you know, what type of cross-profit growth he sees uh, for the year. Obviously, we expect uh, cross-profit uh, to be uh, the source of funding for ASC and, uh, and route to market. The uh, long-term algorithm implies uh, strong mid-single digit high growth. And, and again, I think in, uh, in uh, 2020, if you do the math, we should be uh, around about there. We believe, you know, in the end, the way we are running the business, which is we want to have volume growth, we want to have share gains amplifying a category growth that is uh, projected and uh, exiting uh, the year last year, it was 2.8%, so around about 3 uh, I think that gives us, together with cost savings and investments in, uh, in the business, the ability for us, you know, by not even counting much on below the, the OI or the EBIT line uh, items, gives us the ability to achieve the high single-digit EPS that, uh, you know, is part of the guidance we gave for 2020. And importantly, the three-plus uh, billion dollar of free cash flow that is our long-term uh, guidance for uh, cash um, Steve, just uh, before we switch to the next uh, uh, question, what, did your uh, question also uh, consider uh, the coronavirus in, in China? Was that uh, because I largely 
uh, talked about the economies that we see around the world, but maybe it's also good that I comment a little bit on China and the coronavirus situation for us. Um, so uh, quickly, uh, China is about a 1 billion net revenue country for us, so about 4.5%. Uh, we had a very strong uh, 2019, and it contributed uh, uh, to our growth. Uh, we do believe there will be an impact on our uh, Q1 uh, revenue, but it's really too early to quantify for us at this point. We are monitoring the situation closely, and, and we'll update it you if, in case there is something that we need to report. Um, the, the outbreak has come during Chinese New Year, which is a time of uh, high consumption. Our sell-in was in line with expectations, was quite good. We now have to see in the coming weeks what has happened with the sell-out during Chinese New Year. Um, the other thing that is happening is that normally today our factories, we have four factories in China. Two of our factories are in a region where we normally would have uh, started up our factories again. Uh, the government, the local government is asked to keep our factories uh, closed for another 10 years, uh, sorry, <laughs> 10 days um, in, in order to not have uh, uh, too much of a, of a risk with uh, infection. And we also have voluntarily uh, put some travel restrictions uh, to, to our own people uh, to travel less within China and also for our global people to travel less to China. Um, but overall, I, I would like to uh, point out that uh, we do believe uh, that this could have a, a, a short-term impact, but uh, long-term we continue to be very convinced uh, for the outlook of the Chinese market for us. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Our next question is from Jason English with Goldman Sachs. Hey, folks. Thanks for squeezing me in. Hi. Much appreciated. And um, happy belated New Year. Um, two, two things for me. First, congrats on, um, on, a, on a solid year. Uh, it, it's great to see the momentum, particularly on, on your core business, biscuits and, and chocolate, uh, performing quite nicely. Um, the, the gum and confection side, though, continues to, to languish uh, on the market share side. It's, um, can you touch on what, if any, plans you have to resuscitate that business? Um, so that, that's question one. And then second question, um, in the context of overall the business doing pretty, pretty solid with the portfolio you have, um, can you also then touch on, on your strategic ambitions uh, as we think about M&A and some of the investments that you have out there, the potential to monetize them, the potential to reallocate some of those to build your portfolio in new areas? Um, just update us on your broader thought process on, on strategic direction. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, what I uh, do is I, maybe I'll uh, talk about gum and candy, and then Luca can talk a little bit about uh, our uh, uh, M&A and uh, strategic investments. Um, so uh, there is a, a clear distinction this year in 19 between gum and candy. On gum, uh, what has uh, um, changed or, or not changed is the fact that um, we're doing very well in emerging markets where we are gaining shares in our gum business. Uh, we have year-to-date uh, very good revenue growth. We gain share, uh, particularly in China, which is our second biggest gum market in the world, and in Brazil, we, we are uh, gaining share. It, it is uh, clearly not the strongest category in those markets, but it is positive growth for the category and positive share for us in emerging markets. We continue to be uh, challenged in, in uh, developed markets, um, largely in the U.S. Europe is in a, in, we're clearly seeing a better situation, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's the U.S. that uh, continues to be very difficult for us. Uh, the category is dis displaying now low growth, but it's growing, but we are still losing some share. Um, and and uh, we have some fundamental category challenges and we have some brand challenges. We, we, I would say that on, on our major brand, Trident, uh, things are, are, uh, are quite uh, okay. It's in the smaller brands, which we are gradually, I would say, flush out of the system. That's what is con uh, causing this continued uh, share loss for us. As it relates to uh, candy, I would say um, – the reason why candy was not as vibrant this year was largely due to the U.S. market, where we had a capacity issue. Um, that capacity issue is now uh, solved, and we expect a much better 2020 for our candy business uh, in, in the U.S. Um, I would say that uh, as we um, uh, look at the future plans for, uh, for gum, 
um, it's a difficult uh, situation for us because gum is very profitable and gives us scale in key markets. So it's not something that we can just uh, sort of uh, shift aside. Um, we are working on a number of initiatives to address that share decline. First of all, uh, as I said, strengthening our core uh, brands like Stride in, in China or Trident in the U.S., uh, improving quality, changing the positioning, improving the positioning. We're doing an expansion into mints that, of course, doesn't solve our gum problem, but that does reinforce the brand. And we are having very good results with that in, for instance, France with Hollywood. And then we have uh, started to launch a number of new experiences, new reasons to chew, um, uh, particularly in Brazil, and we are also seeing some very good traction on that. So we have the first sort of uh, test and learns as it relates to uh, renewed uh, initiatives on gum, and we have to see how they'll pan, pan out in 2020. So maybe, Luca, you can talk about uh, yeah. NA. Maybe let's start uh, with uh coffee and uh, I would start by saying that uh, the JVs are performing well and are very attractive at, at this point in time in terms of uh, what we have always described as a financial investment and so there will be a point in time where we will exit those, those investments. Uh, they are good investments, they continue to perform uh, quite strongly. Uh, we had uh, you know, a good earnings growth related to them in, uh, in 2019, and we are expecting solid earnings growth into 2020. Uh, the category itself continues to be uh, attractive. I think in the past we commented a bit into, you know, how much we would welcome uh, uh, an IPO of JDE. I think that would establish a public mark for uh, that investment. Uh, we believe uh, that that eventually will improve our value overall as, uh, as Mondelez, uh, as it is a good asset, and I think it will allow you guys to do a proper sum of the parts uh, analysis for, for Mondelez. Uh, by a way, you know, of, uh, of a segue of, for, for that, I would say also that uh, JD is, uh, is truly a great company, uh, still quite a bit of untapped potential. Uh, it's a compelling growth story uh, as, as a company. And it is a little bit more than uh, than roster ground. I think it, you know, uh, it is uh, a company that has a big presence in uh, premium segments through what we call instant coffee and uh, and on demand, uh, as well as a, a professional presence in terms of you know away from home uh, and servicing other occasions than uh, in home consumption. So we feel quite good about about those. Having said that. The timing of the exit, as we always said, will depend upon how much potential we still see in those companies and, you know, an appropriate use of funds, uh, which potentially is a better uh, M&A and, uh, you know, uh, assets that we like in, uh, in the snacking uh, landscape uh, globally. We will remain uh, disciplined in terms of, uh, of M&A, and we have discussed that uh, our preference at this point in time is on both tones. Uh, we are looking at uh, premium well-being areas, adjacencies, uh, and uh, trying to fill some of the portfolio gaps we have, both geographically and, uh, and category-wise in, in some places around the world. So we believe that by staying disciplined, um, we, have, we will have the ability, you know, to fill some of these gaps and uh, step up even more our growth rate on the top line and, uh, and on earnings as well. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. We'll take our final question from Tim Sassi with Bank of Montreal. Good afternoon, everyone. I just have uh, two quick questions. One is, on the investment, at what point do, do they become self-funding? I know they've had good returns, but how do you think about the years in which that will just kind of kind of be a you know, virtuous cycle? And the second question I have is, in Europe, what has the utilization rates been in the facilities, and where are they now, and, and where they look to be? Because, it, you know, it seems like that part of the – opportunity that you guys continue to leverage over time is as you get more volume through it, there's operating leverage. And I'll leave it those, those two. Okay, maybe I'll, I'll talk about uh, the investments and then Luca can talk about the operating uh, leverage. Yeah. Um, so um, when the investments uh, become uh, self-funding, I think um, it's still a little bit away for us. We, we, we feel that we have potential to drive the categories around the world. And um, we see good reaction, good return on investment still. 
And so um, as we are uh, trying to develop a long-term algorithm that is repeatable year after year, at this stage it feels that the algorithm allows us to keep on uh, adding more investment every year, and hopefully that translates into this, this strong is our last They'll be down and just. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, and so um, I, I would say um, at a certain stage, extra investments will not generate more growth, and then we have to start questioning it. But at this stage, it's, it's working really well for us. So it is self funding. I mean, for the algorithm to work and for us to be able to deliver upon the premise of share growth, high single digit DPS, and $3 billion of, of cash flow, uh, that algorithm itself includes a level of investment which is factored in and it is you know allowing us to hit on, on uh, all those numbers i think in the end the measure of success for us is whether we will be able to deliver uh, share gains uh, consistently and the second one is uh, if we increase our volume consistently all of that came to fruition in uh, in 2019 uh, then the second uh, part of the question, I, uh, there was a little bit of a disturbance in the line. Could you repeat it, maybe? I think I, I got it. It was about yeah. It's a, on the European the European side, you know, it, it seems like you keep on getting margin expansion. Uh, your utilization, you know, basically the assets have been put together through acquisitions. As you keep on getting leverage and do some restructuring a little bit, it sounds like you know the, the utilization rate should continue to increase. Where have they been, where are they, and where are they going, I guess, is kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah, look, I, I think uh, in general terms we don't comment on capacity utilization. By each other. I think that's, uh, you know, that, that would be a bit of, of too much of a comment, I would say. Uh, look, we have invested quite a bit in terms of uh, both creating a more nimble and a more flexible organization, both in uh, overheads and, and infrastructure. It's not only legacy sites. We invested uh, in, uh, in brand new sites in Europe. Uh, and Europe, I remind you, is a little bit more than continental Europe or UK. It is also Russia in our case. So I would characterize the old status of the facilities in, uh, in Europe uh, quite good. It can be further optimized, um, but we still have available capacity in terms of, you know, of continuing growing the big blockbuster brands that we have. Milka is one example, Cadbury, Oreo, but also the local brands, and uh, I think that's what uh, we are working on. Great. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Um, well, uh, in conclusion, I would say that uh, 2019 was a major step forward uh, for the company. And it was the first full year of executing our new strategy. Um, we've successfully launched and driven this more consumer-centric approach uh, to get growth across our organization. And as a result, we're building in a, an effective local first culture that is delivering. Uh, we had a good finish to the year with broad-based uh, revenue growth and strong earnings and cash flow. Um, and the momentum we've created uh, across our brands and our geographies this past year reinforces our confidence that we have in our strategy, our people, and our ability to execute. This is, there is certainly more work to do, and, and a long way of uh, opportunities is ahead of us. But we believe that the early success uh, combines with the attractive category dynamics and further targeted uh, investments provides us greater confidence that we can deliver sustained long-term growth and attractive total returns. With that, I would like to end the call. Thank you for assisting. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.